Hello, I'm Diabetes the Second, and this recording of Dragon Warrior 2 Randomizer is for submission to Questing for Glory under the NES Dragon Warrior Randomizer's Relay Race category, uh, which is planned to be a continuous three-team relay race of randomized seeds of Dragon Warrior 1, 2, 3, and 4. Each seed is played by a different runner per team, with a two-minute changeover time between teammates upon seed completion. And there is anticipated in, uh, independent commentary and tracking to accompany the race as well. So the flags that we'll be racing has been agreed upon, is intended to provide a combination of challenge to the runners, entertainment value to the audience, and consistency of times to the uh, marathon administrators. Quickly summing them up, the map layout is randomized, but one quarter in total land area. The hero's stat growth and spell learning is randomized. Chest and search spots have shuffled contents. Shops have shuffled inventories. Monsters have randomized abilities and attack patterns. XP needed to level and gold is cut in half. And encounter rates turned down with fast text and sped up battle animations enabled. So we're going to go ahead and get started here. For those not familiar with Dragon Warrior 2, the evil sorcerer Hargon has upset the peace by sacking Moonbird Castle, unleashing monsters upon the land. Lone Survivor makes it to Maidenhall, who just informed the king of all of this, so it falls to you, the Prince of Maidenhall, to save the world. Here we are starting off with a Steel Shield, which is good for a little bit of a defensive boost. Stats otherwise are passable enough. So checking item shops is of pretty significant importance. We noticed that there was a big blank spot in that particular shop, and that is going to be the Jailer's Key, originally sold to Belgarth in the original game. We'll also be looking for the Echoing Flute. We stuck our head in that cave to find it is the Lake Cave. It's not the one that we're looking for quite yet. We're looking for the Spring of Bravery. First, we'll need to find Canock Castle, however. Of course, some enemies are rather dangerous. <laughs> As we said in the, uh... In the, uh, description of the flags for this, we do have enemies with randomized abilities, so... Apparently, big slugs are rather dangerous, at least in the early game. So part of our quest here, as a descendant of the great Erdrich, it's falling to us to save the world. You know, he's the one who rescued the world from the Dragon Lord generations ago in Dragon Warrior 1, and we're going to seek out others who share our bloodline, the Prince of neighboring Canock and the Princess of Moonbrook to join the quest, and together we're going to fight monsters and turn-based full-party battles, gaining experience points to level up, gold to purchase useful items and equipment, all in order to become stronger as we seek out the dangers that lie ahead. Along the way, we're going to gather several magical runes called Crests that, once assembled and brought to the shrine of the ancient enchantress Rubus, will form a charm to cut through the evil Hargon's illusions. Uh, we're also going to locate the mysterious Eye of Malroth that reveals the way to Hargon's stronghold in Roan. And once there, we're going to battle against the toughest foes and even Hargon himself before taking on the ultimate evil. Here we have found Castle Canock. To advance the story forward, we need to talk to the king here. We're interested in finding the prince, and we're going to learn that the prince sadly has just left on a journey of his own. So we're going to have to go seek him out. the town of Leftwin. This is another town that's kind of in the early area of the game. It gives us our first weapon shop. A couple of important items here. We see the Thunder Sword, the Shield of Strength, and the Staff of Thunder. Dragon Killer is worth noting that it exists as well. So we did pass another cave that is going to be the Spring of Bravery. The only two caves that we'll find here on the opening continent. We need to get the back of the cave here. There's also three treasure chests that we would also like to check, if possible. So 
Unfortunately, we have Encounter Rate turned down just a little bit. Allows us to navigate through this at level 1 a little bit more easily. And much like our trip to Cannock Castle, we have found that the Prince of Cannock has departed before we arrived. So we have to go seek him out again somewhere else. Chain Sigil there, a slight improvement for the hero in terms of attack power. Two more chests to check is here as well. Things that we're looking for here in the early game. Primarily, the number one thing is the Mirror of Ra. That will allow us to collect the Princess of Moonbrook and add her to the party. We can also find any number of quest items, including the Crests, the Eye of Malroth, or the Golden Key would be the other big thing that we'd be interested in finding this early. Not super common that you're going to find a crest, the eye, or a key, but it's certainly possible and will open up a number of checks that we can make significantly earlier than we would be able to otherwise, and also without a lot of backtracking. That was found the sun crest. So that's crest number one in our pocket. In our quest to find five. Three of those are loose, which we just found one of them. Two are in fixed locations, because they're kind of tied to events in the storyline of the original game, so they are still tied to those events here in the randomizer. Let us run, but uh, he runs from us. Uh, fair enough. So the old man at the spring said, "Oh, Prince Canog, he went back to Maidenhall. He was looking for you. You've missed. You just missed him." Turns out, if we were to go to Maidenhall, the king there would say, "Ah, oh, he just left," and he was here in Leftwind on his way back home looking for you still, so we did kind of meet him here in the middle. So we've added our first party member to the team. Check out his stats. High HP is pretty good. We have the return spell and the defeat spell, so defeat is extremely useful. It could be very helpful in gaining levels, not only here in the kind of early and then eventually into the mid game, but especially in the late game when there's a lot of very difficult enemies the defeat spell can target groups of enemies and potentially take them out all at once. All right, moving here into the lake cave, we just find the ar uh, armor of Erdrick just laying around. One of the best armors in the game. Massive improvement for the hero. Those were really not taking too many fights here at the outset. In general, it's not strictly necessary to fight a lot. If we had really nice equipment, particularly good attack power, it might be worth. But considering we don't really... A lot of these enemies aren't worth all that much. At least a couple levels helps out with stats, helps us run away a little bit more effectively, sustain with higher HP. We'll see if we can go a little bit without doing all that. Hey, the golden key! So that is another key item that we will need to complete the game in almost every possible circumstance. Not always. But in most cases, we will need that. Specifically, that's opening up a number of checks here right at the start of the game that we now no longer will have to backtrack significantly for. First, though, five more chests to check here. We've got the Cursed Gremlin's Armor. Not something we're going to want to equip. Probably something that we're going to sell to purchase something that we actually want. Hmm. Cannock being poisoned, we don't have the Antidote spell or Antidote herb, so likely that he is going to 
succumb to poison here shortly. Mm, kind of rethinking taking that battle, it's probably a good idea. Alas, brave Kanak has died. There's the Dragon Killer. That is a fantastic weapon for the Prince of Mightenhall, seeing that's plus 40 additional attack power over the Chain Sickle. One chest left. If we can get there, fantastic. Otherwise, it's an orphaned check. Typically, I don't like to orphan checks if I if I can help it. We have found some of the key items that I'd be most interested in, but if the Mirror of Ra is here, I'm going to want to get it on this pass. And it's just a small pile of gold pieces. So we'll walk our way back out here. We could take off our armor and just hope for a, a death warp. Taking a death will eliminate half of our gold, but we will go back to the last place that we saved. In this case, it's probably going to be just as fast to walk out, considering the lower encounter rate. But we'll take out some enemies, and if we get killed along the way, that's not a problem. Hmm. There's levels of 0 and 1 attack power. Not inspiring. Continuing to make our way out of the lake cave here, picking up another level. Our primary task next, aside from making the checks in Kanok and Maidenhall castles, there we get the death refill, will be to go across and visit the town of Hamlin. Now that we have picked up the Prince of Kanok, we are actually able to go across that cave. It would not allow us to do so if we did not pick him up. Just a small pile of cash here in Kanok, guarded by the golden key door and that wise gentleman. Whoa! There's the defeat spell. So we'll make a quick pit stop back in left wind, resurrect Kanok. Since we've had miserable luck running away from just about everything, perhaps we'll take a few fights along the way. At least ones that make sense to take. Okay, these five chests here are five more opportunities to look for key items. Other things that we'd be looking for would be strong equipment that we can either equip or sell for other equipment that we also are interested in. There's another dragon killer. So that will be cell fodder, leaf of the world tree, evil shield, shield of Erdrick, 
and the chain sickle. Having to shuffle around inventory a little bit here. Prince of Mightenhall is quite well outfitted at this point. Let's see how much we can sell some of this other equipment for. Chainsickle, not too much. Also helps to just have a nice clean inventory. 3300 for the Evil Shield, not bad. Thousand for the Dragon Killer as well. Hmm. The thing that's catching my eye here is the fact that there is a golden card for ten thousand gold. So the golden card is normally a reward for winning the lottery in Dragon Warrior Two, and it applies a discount toward any future purchases made in any shops. When you find one, it's fantastic. It can be helpful in purchases if you're making purchases of extremely expensive equipment. In this case, since I'm barely able to afford it, or would be barely able to afford it, probably not the best approach. Well, there's the big slugs. So we just lost half our cash. Not ideal. We last saved in Canock. That's where we went when we died. It's also where the return spell takes us, but it's faster to use that than walk through the entire castle. I think I'm rethinking this here now. So we did mention that there was some particularly useful equipment over in Leftwind. And the things that we saw in particular were the Staff and Sword of Thunder and the Shield of Strength. And there's particular reasons why those items are very important. So shields of strength, aside from the fact that it's a fairly decent shield for the here for Mightenhall, and a very good shield for the Prince of Canock, when you use the shield of strength in battle, it effectively acts as a self-heal more. So if you don't have the heal more spell, for example, at this level we don't have any healing spells. But the Prince of Mightenhall doesn't learn magic at all. It does allow him the ability to effectively cast spells. At least a single spell to heal himself. So that's very helpful. The Staff of Thunder is the strongest piece of equipment or weapon that the Prince of Cannot can equip. It's the strongest piece of equipment that the Princess of Moonbrook can equip. And also, if you use the Staff of Thunder in battle, it casts Infernos over the enemy party. So again, saves on magic. It's one source of an AoE attack, can be extremely helpful, and even the Prince of Mightenhall can use that in battle as well. Because the chests respawn, we're able to kind of pick up those two expensive items, they each sold for about 3,000 gold, and our goal would be to basically port them over to left wind, sell them there, and then make a couple of purchases of expensive equipment. It's going to be extremely useful for us and increase our sustainability out in the world significantly. So this is a little bit perhaps annoying or, or whatever, but it's it's very, very good setup for continuing the run. Other equipment that we'll be looking for as we continue on. Um, if we happen to see the Sword of Destruction somewhere in uh, a shop, that would be quite preferable. Sword of Destruction is the strongest weapon that can be equipped by the Prince of Maidenhall, but it is cursed. 
but we will talk about a glitch in the end game where it becomes potentially very useful. The Light Sword is the strongest non-cursed sword that uh, we can purchase for the Prince of Maidal, so that would be useful to identify. The Falcon Sword, which doesn't have great attack power, but allows the hero that equips it, whether that's the Prince of Maidenhall or the Prince of Canock, to attack twice per turn. And the other big one, and arguably the most important, is the Water Flying Cloth. Very strong armor, all three can equip, and it bestows protection against breath attacks, which is absolutely essential in the endgame. No, don't sell the Jailer's Key. Alright, a good 30,000 gold pieces to our name. We saw a Shields of Strength here, that's probably what we're going to aim for first. Double checking the price for the Thunder Sword and Staff of Thunder. It's a little bit too much. Shield Strength not quite as good as a Shield of Erdrick, but very good for the Prince of Kanak. Nope. Wrong cave. Need to go to the shrine. So actually three different ways we could go here, to the left and down, down through here we could also have opened that golden key door, choosing to do this because this kind of goes more along the lines of the intended path. If we go through the gold key door we're likely to encounter very difficult enemies more quickly, so hopefully if we go this way it'll be a little bit easier on us. Alright, we have another shrine that will, again, connect us to a couple of different places. Oh! Lizard flies have defeat. Good to know. Probably try to avoid those in the future. We got a little, a little bit lucky getting ourselves out of that fight. Lots of run fails, but we do succeed eventually. Did not succumb to the defeat spell. A couple more locations here. This is one of our towers. This looks to be the Tower of Wind. We will... Considering we only have one alive party member who's currently half-dead, probably just check the one treasure chest and then exit, hopefully come back and pick up the rest in a little bit. This is the other end of the shrine that led to Ham or is going to lead to the Hamlin continent. There is a town right next door as well. Let's see if we can get in there. Or we won't. Unfortunately, this takes us all the way back to Maidenhall Castle, so we'll have to go back through the cave. That is one downside. It's not until Dragon Warrior 3 that the return spell or the Wings of the Wyvern are able to take you to different locations at your own choosing. So we will just have to kind of strategically establish save points along the way. 
This time our intended destination is close to the other end of this cave, so we will go this other path this time. Nope, there's a search spot here as well. So we're going to check that. Staff of Thunder. That is a huge find. One, really good piece of equipment. Two, worth a lot of cash that we can sell. way to Hamlin. We don't have the Mirror of Ra yet, so we cannot pick up the Princess of Moonbrook. Not really anything more in the item shops that we need, with the exception of the Echoing Flute would be a nice pickup. Checking things out here. Eh. Magic Armor for Kanok is about as good as we can do. Otherwise, none of our other big ticket items are available. about exiting the town, but the better thing to do right now would be to establish our save point here. That way, if we were to perish outside or something else happens, if we need cast return, we'll head back here. Since we happen to already have the golden key and the jailer's key, we can make a check here. There's another search tile. If we are able to take out the Oswargs here, They can call in reinforcements. And poisonous. And cast Firebane. And revive. Wow. Lots of unfortunate things. Probably should have continued to cast the defeat spell. It was at least semi-effective. Unfortunately, we are going to succumb to them this time. Uh, it looks like we fast texted our way through the tr music transition. Staying at the inn will fix that. Also, re restore our magic points. The nice thing is, even though we died, they're gone! <laughs> So we can still check the search tile. We just don't get the experience and the gold from the battle. The gold we don't need. The XP is not all that significant. And it is a golden card. We could sell that for about 7,500 gold, or we could keep it and apply a discount toward any future purchases that we make. Which is kind of nice, since there are, again, several fairly expensive pieces of equipment we'd be looking for moving forward. Still looking for the Mirror of Ra, most likely place is here in the Tower of Wind. We're 
already checked one treasure chest. There are two others here. Technically, there's four total. But the one at the very top is empty in vanilla and is also empty always in randomizer as well. So no sense going up to the very top. Armor of Gaia... Hmm... Not gonna be as good as the Armor of Erdrick, probably not worth picking up. We'd rather have the Staves of Thunder, either for using or selling. And the Prince of Cana cannot equip it, unfortunately. Our lack of strength is continuing to be a point of concern. And there's the Mirror of Ra, perfect. Throw away the chain sickle. Spell of return does not work in the tower, but if we just walk off the edge, we are back outside. pick up the Princess of Moonbrook. She will complete our party. She's actually been in town all along. Our Princess Doggo friend. Apparently she was transformed into a dog by one of Hargon's minions during the sacking of Moonbrook. So the Princess has joined the party. Probably move some items around, we'll get her a Staff of Thunder, see if there's anything else that we can equip her with. She has the Open spell, which is tremendously useful. Not as much in this seed, because we already have the Jailer's Key and the Golden Key, but if we didn't, the Open spell opens any locked door in the game, and would include any door that can be opened by the Golden or Jailer's Key, so it's a bit unfortunate that uh, we aren't going to end up needing it. management and back out into the world. So now the world is kind of our oyster. We have pretty much open exploration of the rest of the world at this point. We have any number of places to continue to look for and to check. One other place in particular that we do want to locate is the town of Leonport. That will give us access to a boat so we can get off of this prime continent and go elsewhere. Since the world is randomly generated, there's no specific guarantee that any particular town has to be located or co-located with anything else outside of the initial uh, the initial location that has uh, Maiden Hall, Canuck, etc. All the randomized enemy abilities have certainly gotten to us quite effectively. We got exploded pretty pretty thoroughly in that one. Again, different options. So we're going to go through this cave slash effectively teleporter. We have a 
another cave immediately on the other side. And this is the road to Roan. So that's... the road to the final dungeon is right there. Good that we have it already marked on our map. But we are far too low level to make a play at that now. There are eight treasure chests there, though, so the likelihood of finding something useful or something required, like one of the crests, is fairly high. Got another cave. It's the so-called Swamp North, if you will. Again, it's just another transport cave. And we've got a familiar sighting in Castle Tanthagil. Let's revive some party members. we got a shop we can check. We could also establish a save point here. It's not one of the ones I would commonly uh, utilize, but certainly can be. It's not that far from the Rhone Cave, which would be worth keeping in mind. Falcon Sword and Water Flying Cloth. We have both of them here. We definitely want to get at least one Falcon Sword. And ideally, we'll get enough Water Flying Clothes right now for all three party members. This is why we picked up all those extra Staves of Thunder. sell the one that Maidenal has. He's not going to end up equipping it. It is useful in battle for AoE. It's a tough call. You see the golden card giving us the 25% discount actually does make a significant difference in our ability to afford a lot of this really expensive equipment. So Water Flank Glow is technically a little bit less strong than Erdrick's armor. Maidenhall, but again, the protection it, it has long term is just frankly too superior that the small difference in defense power is really going to matter, so we'll go ahead and sell that. Ideally, we get Falcon Sword for both Maidenhall and Canuck, but we absolutely need it for Maidenhall. So we will get the one that we can afford right now. We won't equip it, but we'll have it. Metal Slime would be fantastic if we can kill it. Damage. Ah. Metal Slimes and then Metal Babbles are extremely valuable. And if you can find them, not only are you going to have a huge influx of experience, but potentially if you can identify a good zone to find them, that could be even your end game level grind. Here we have the Forest Triple Shrine. We'll take the center portal over to the Grass Triple Shrine, which has a search tile. The Eye of Malroth, another one of our key quest items. So having picked up the Eye of Malroth, now if we can find ourselves an Echoing Flute, which I should have checked the item shop in Tanthagil for, we haven't seen one yet. Once we walk into a location, if we play the Echoing Flute, if we hear an echo, that means that one of the crests is present. The eye does not respond, so that would still be something that we would have to look for and basically go through all the chests in a location, even if a crest is not present. But now, we can skip anything that doesn't echo.
trying to make best use of our limited ability to attack different groups of enemies. Unfortunately, Moonbrook, just too low a level. This is going to be a pretty decent experience gain. Unfortunately, she's going to miss out. Mm. That's another terrible level for Maidenhall. Only 6 HP. Kenok still doesn't have any healing spells. Another shrine. Oh, this is Rubus's shrine. We will need to come here once we have picked up all of our quest items. We've got a... Okay. So we have found our way back to the road to Roan. So apparently we just missed the uh, tower here off screen earlier. It's going to be either the lighthouse or a tower of the moon. It is Tower of the Moon. With Moonbrook dead, and at very low resources, ideally we'll explore and find a town here so we can heal up first. Or we can always just head back to Tanthagel. That will work too. Staff of Thunder AOE feels good, man. Heard a few notes of the Alephgard theme there. It's a little bit wonky in Randomizer. Um, in the vanilla game, the entirety of Tanthagel does exist in a truncated, smaller form. And while you're on that landmass, you do hear the original overworld music from Dragon Warrior, but Randomizer, eh, it kind of doesn't really know what to do with you a lot of times. Okay, Charlotte Castle. Again, we that's the difficulty with uh, the map generation. Sometimes can be very challenging. There's large contiguous land masses where you can't necessarily always follow the edges and get a full lay of the land. Plus, with all of the interconnectedness of the various um, transport shrines and caves and things, it's very easy to miss out on small parts of an interior landmass. This is actually several locations kind of all nested among the different areas that we've explored so far. Strike critically. And boy, did he ever. Kenok never stood a chance. We'll still see if we can try to navigate our way through the uh, Tower of the Moon here. Kenok does have a Leaf of the World tree that we could move over to somebody else and revive him. Ideally, I'd also like to keep that in my pocket just in case of emergency. They are available in shops for about 2,500 gold, so it is replaceable. So we've got the full plate armor. Again, worse than anything that we currently have. So either something to sell or throw away. Oh, there goes Moonbrook. Not having the best time thought about bugging out and healing and coming back, but let's see if we can push through. One thing Maidenhall does have is he has fantastic defense. Another steel shield. Still looking for two loose crests. Sword and the Sword of Destruction. 
that is very interesting. Again, we don't want to equip it, it will curse us, and if we were to be cursed, then we will only connect with attacks uh, a certain percentage of the time, otherwise we freeze in terror or something. Basically, it's, a, it's paralysis is the curse. But again, we'll, we'll, we'll talk about the, the illusion glitch when we get to the end game. Unfortunately, characters that are dead can't use keys. I can hand them keys, I can take keys from them, but they can't use the keys, so we'll have to give the key to Might and All. One more chest to check here. And it's a pile of cash. So nothing of tremendous significance here in the Tower of the Moon. And ideally I would have picked up an echoing flute at some point. We hadn't seen one, although there were a few shops that we didn't check. That way we would have known that the Tower of the Moon did not have a crest and therefore could have been skipped. Meanwhile, we get sent back to Hamlin, which is a bit of a setback, although there are plenty of transport shrines and caves around to get us where we need to go. Nice crit. Prince of Kanok, you're redeeming yourself. So that thousand experience points is more than triple we've gotten in any other battle so far in the seed, so that gives you a bit of an idea. That accounts for about 40% of our total XP in the seed. And a metal babble, too! Oh, it ran away. Unfortunately, there is a hard cap of 9,999 XP per battle in Dragon Warrior 4. And Metal Babbles, again, it's, it is a little bit of randomized uh, factor in there, but they are worth at least several thousand as we find another Armor of Erdrick. Apparently they're all over the place. So search tile number two doesn't have what we're looking for. goes down again, unfortunately. Ideally, we'll find a spot to heal her. We have the lighthouse, okay? Again, this is another long location that ideally we would not want to go through and check all the chests if we don't have to. That said, one of our fixed position crests is here, so it is worth knowing that we will have to go through the lighthouse regardless. It's just how much of that side content do we need to take advantage of or not. Two castles next to each other, the ruined castle of Moonbrook, and the kingdom of Osterfair. So this is the other location of a fixed crest. Fortunately, we do not have the ability to resurrect Moonbrook here. Do another shop that we can check. We've seen most of what we're interested in. Light Sword potentially would be of interest. Water, water flying clothes, but again, we already have our full party equipped with them. Saber Lion likes to cast Increase a lot, but that's no problem for our heroes. And there's crest number two. So three crests to go. 
One we know is right next door in the lighthouse, the other two loose in chests somewhere. We do have two additional chests that we can pick up here, in the back of Osterfair. Shopkeeper is just gonna, you know, not recognize that we're stealing his wares. Unfortunately, just some weak armor, clothes, and chainmail. I'm gonna go ahead and throw away the armor of Erdrich again as well. Transport Shrine will take us to the Fire Shrine. We'll have to see where exactly this is. Again, just more teleporting around the world. It seems to be near the top of the map. Another cave. We've been here before. This is the Jerk Cave. The Jerk being kind of a, a joke term in the community. The gentleman in Dragon Warrior 1 who wants the Erdrich's Token, Staff of Rain, Stones of Sunlight. If you don't have everything, particularly the token, he kicks you out of the cave forcibly. So we call him a Jerk. That's him, too. Need to give him Erdrich's token if we were to find it. So, we venture into the lighthouse. With two party members, I don't love this play, but... Osterfair is the only nearby town. We don't have the ability to resurrect there. We do have a Leaf of the World Tree, but I'd like to save it if possible. And with no Echoing Flute, we're not sure if our items are going to be here or not, other than the single crest that is guaranteed to be here. So I could just make a mad dash for the top, or I could try to make the checks along the way. to make. Leather shield is not particularly helpful. We'll throw that away. So three more checks plus the guaranteed crest. Looks like we are making the play for the additional checks as well. to run for most enemies. Ideally, we're just trying to survive this. Gaining XP is not that critical. I mean, in the grand scheme it is, but we're not going to be picking up that much from a lot of these encounters, and since these encounters are mixed and can be very dangerous, we still don't have healing outside of battle at all, and even healing in battle is fairly limited. We do have Shields of Strength, which we did just take advantage of there, uh, but that is not a, a full, safe opportunity to heal. A couple of magic ants guarding the chest. Which is the life crest. Okay. I'm glad we made these checks. So that is crest number three. Crest number four is at the end of this dungeon. So just one more loose crest to find. struggles with running. I haven't checked Maidenhall's agility or anything, but our ability to run seems pretty poor throughout the seed so far.
continuing to make our way up through the lighthouse. Next chest is the treasures. So the treasures, if we take those to Leonport, we don't have a silver key, but we do have Moonbrook with the open spell. We can open a silver key door there to get an echoing flute. And that certainly would be helpful in our quest for the final crest. We've not found Leonport, though. with the defeat. That's going to make Sword of Erdrick. Feels bad, like, throwing that away, but uh, it's probably not going to be useful for us. The Prince does have a leaf. The problem with Leaf of the World Tree, like the Revive spell in Dragon Warrior 2, Resurrection only takes you to 1 HP, since we don't have any other way to heal other than the Shield of Strength in battle right now. It would be very risky. We would need the right battle to go into to resurrect the, he uh, the Prince of Maidenhall. Hope he doesn't get immediately murdered before he's able to hold up the Shield of, Str shield of Strength and heal himself. But if we're going to complete the lighthouse, it's probably fairly unlikely that uh, Might and Hulk can do it, or uh, Cannot can do it alone. Maybe if he can defeat uh, the final uh, mini boss here. Good opportunity to top off the HP. That would be the perfect battle to do it but I would need to already have resurrected before that. I'm stuck menuing things around here. Ideally, I probably should just resurrect... Yeah. Resurrect Maidenhall and then not have to move the key around, but it is what it is. get into that encounter. This one's not great. We know Gorons have defeat. Eh, this looks passable enough. Yes. Excellent. We can run up from that and head toward the mini-boss. Now, if you happen to walk off the edge here, you will leave the tower the same way that you will for the others that we've seen. So you do have, need to be cautious of that. I'm also kind of pausing slightly at each floor, because if we follow right behind the old man, we actually have a dialogue encounter at each stairwell, so we're just avoiding that by pausing momentarily. This dialogue, though, we're locked into. It's a trap! Fortunately, just some gremlins. We've already seen a number of these. They're not too bad. Try defeat. Staff of Thunder. Works pretty well. Of course, defeat worked only on the ones that also... <laughs> Uh, took thunder damage, but no problem. Star's Crest, that is crest number four. As soon as we find the last crest, we've got some homework to do and some level grinding, and then we're ready to go.
and kind of rediscovering the various connections here. Rubus Shrine just off to the north, Tower of the Moon there. This should be Sherlock Castle. Uh, electing not to dive, again, perhaps remembering that we really should just try to find an Echoing Flute. Worst comes to worst, explore, look for Leon Port, and we know that we can turn one, or uh, turn in the treasures for one there. Again, the reason why that's important is we can skip a whole bunch of dungeons that we don't need to dive by doing so, and there are several that we still have yet to really go through. Charlock Castle has a number of checks, so that's one. We have the town of Zahan. We have the Sea Cave, which is very long. We have the Road to Roan, which, if we don't have to do anything beyond the straightforward line to progress through, that would be ideal. So if we can skip any of those by realizing, just from the entrance, if there's nothing here that we need, we certainly will take that advantage. Gotten back to Tanthagil, we'll go ahead and revive Moonbrook. Maybe she'll actually get some experience points for once. She can stay alive for more than 40 seconds. Smartly going over and checking what we should have checked before for the Echoing Flute. western edge of the map here. Continuing back north, we'll hop into Sherlock and see, is this where our fifth and final crest lay? No echo, no crest. Mr. Dragonlord, we'll catch you next time. cave here. This could be the sea cave. It is the so-called Swamp South. We saw Swamp North earlier. Several towns we've not seen yet. Haven't seen Zahan, Baran, Welgarth, Toon, Leonport. It's very surprising. familiar? We've been here before. This is the Fire Shrine. Earlier we went to the west, I believe. Again, mapping can be of critical importance. Otherwise, it's very easy to get lost. There's our double castles. Ah, and just tucked over here to the southwest, sorry, southeast of the Fire Shrine, we have the town of Zahan. So we did see this earlier, so one chest, one search tile. So we get through the too many NPCs on screen lag. Dog leads us to the search tile, which is a little bit of cash. Fortunately, one of the few steps or spells we do learn, or have learned so far, is Step Guard. Other chest, and an odor herb. Not exciting. And technically we could have blown the flute and known, but it is a little bit... Ugh, old man, making me take damage. Getting in the way.
And which shrine are you? So this is the Baran Shrine, so we could go through that shrine and find the town of Baran. Not really a reason to specifically, though, however. Not really looking for any additional equipment. There is a save spot there. Nice power gain for the Prince of Mightenhall. 13 big attack power. Uh, do we need to do anything in tune? Not really. This is normally where you would get the water flying cloth in the vanilla game. Oh boy. Eight metal slimes. Try some AoE stuff. I believe in this flag set, that's not going to work, unfortunately. Resistances to various abilities and spells is not randomized in this flag set, so while it would be fantastic to just AoE away an entire party of Metal Slimes, just attacking them is our best option. Fortunately, we were not able to kill any of them. Another town on the horizon there, just to the east. And there are several we still have not seen. Keep in mind, this encounter rate is turned down. <laughs> Just kind of reinforces how very aggressive the encounter rate is in the vanilla game. And finally, we have the town of Leonport, so we'll heal up here, and we can go up and rescue the fair young maiden, and that will get us our boat. We don't lend boats to strangers. You gotta rescue my granddaughter first. Okay, okay. Gremlins are not too much of a problem. Now, since we picked up the Echoing Flute, we don't need to do this turn in. This item that we do get here is not randomized. This is just going to be an Echoing Flute. How you get the echoing flute in the vanilla game, it isn't available in the shops. Go ahead and discard the extra one. We're trying to see where we are. These are early game enemies, so I would imagine we're back on the continent where we started. If we find a shrine down here in the corner, which we do, this is definitely the starting continent. Alright, back to Hamlin. So we could go by boat and explore around a little bit. We do have a couple of additional options if we choose. Kind of navigating, trying to figure out exactly what I do want to do. We do not know that the road to Roan is just on the other side of this cave. We can check there to see if our final crest is there. If not, we can go exploring. Looking for one of the remaining locations. An echo. Alright, our final crest is here on the road to Roan. 
a total of eight possibilities. Not all very easy to get to, necessarily. And lots of very strong enemies along the way. So if we are lucky, we'll be able to get this. And move on forward. It's not impossible that we'll have to do kind of a mid-game grind Thunder Sword, very strong. Strongest sword that we can find outside of the Cursed Sword for the Prince of Maidenhall. So make sure that he gets that in his hand. Still, no healing outside of battle, unfortunately. That is going to be one of our biggest hang-ups here moving forward, unless we start learning spells very quickly. Even heal more, or even heal, would be great, although we would like Princess of Moonbrook at least to have the heal all spell. Moving into the end game. Other spells that are very useless, Defense, which takes down enemy defense. If the Princess of Moonbrook could learn that, that would be fantastic. Sometimes Increase for the Prince of Cannot can also be helpful to increase our defense. And Stop Spell, to prevent Hargon or Malroth from casting Heal All all the time. Also very important. The water crest, that's our final crest. Let's go. Officially grind and go mode now. We just gotta make our way back to the Rubish Shrine once I remember where that is. It's actually right there, I just passed it. If I go directly east, I'll find it. Nice. With that Thunder Sword pickup, Maidenhall now has enough attack power to one shot Metal Slimes. We got two 3,400 experience points. Pick up several levels. Alright, Kanak and Moonbrook have learned some spells. Hopefully, one of those is healing hopefully also with use in battle. Making sure I have inventory space. The crests themselves don't take up inventory space, but Rubus the Enchantress here will give us the charm that will allow us to see through all of Hargon's illusions. So we need to make sure that we have the inventory space to collect it. We do. Fortunately, the outside spell does not work here, so we will have to walk up the several flights of stairs. And now, it's just a matter of grinding until we're ready to take on the final boss, and of course, getting to there. A couple of different options when it comes to the end game grind in Dragon Warrior 2. So we've seen a couple of locations that did have eight metal slime battles. We know that the Prince of Maidenhall can take them out in one shot. That is worth looking for, although, you know, individual battles are not guaranteed or necessarily even very likely uh, to occur within a particular enemy zone. So we could end up fighting a lot of junk along the way, is what I'm trying to say. So that could be particularly challenging. On the other hand, we could go through the road to Roan, and on the other side, we have a place that we can heal for free, 
We can save for free, resurrect for free. Also has very strong enemies that are typically worth several hundred to around a thousand experience. So that also could be very fast. They're also very difficult. But definitely worth considering. Moonbrook unfortunately goes down yet again. And Poison Lilies live up to their name. Unfortunately, we do not have the Antidote spell. We threw away our only Antidote herb. We'll return to Hamlin. Resurrect Moonbrook. Again. Probably should <clears throat> cure that poison too. Yeah. Back to the House of Healing. It's been 60 seconds since your last visit. thing about returning to Hamlin is as soon as we go through the cave here, we know that the road to Rhone is right on the other side. Kind of considering the options, though, we did see Metal Slimes just to the northwest here. So perhaps worth taking a look and see if we can pick up a few more of them. Again, certainly by far the easiest things that we can kill for experience. I think you're seeing the other types of encounters you're going to be getting. 70, 80, 100, 120 XP, XP per battle. And lots of these mixed battles that aren't necessarily very conducive to using an AoE attack or something else. Also, AoE poison that we can't cure without going to town. Great! I think that's sufficiently soured me on staying in this zone <laughs> to try to find more metal slimes. Kenok did learn the heal spell. It's the weakest of the healing spells, but it at least is a healing spell. So we can use that outside of battle to kind of top ourselves off, heal up if we get too hurt. levels were a little bit on the low side, it's usually probably fairly advisable to at least get Maidenhall up to around level 20 or so, and Moonbrook to around level 15 or so if possible. It does depend on your stats and spells and the equipment uh, uh, loadout that you have. In this particular case, we have an extremely good uh, loadout basically for everybody, so that I don't think is going to be a problem. Spells, eh, we're a little bit on the lacking side. That may be our hang-up. I don't believe that we have defense, increase, heal all, or stop spell, all of which extremely useful. to make any treasure chest checks this time. 
just navigating our way through as quickly and as alive as possible. Easier said than done. Unfortunately, the heal spell is going to really put in a little bit of work here. Healers were none too friendly with their fireball spell. Kind of into the maze phase of Roan. Not that the rest of it isn't a maze, but in this particular set of circumstances, there's multiple ways to exit out of every screen, and if you choose the wrong one, you go back to the beginning of the floor. As we discover, green dragons, very much similar to their vanilla counterparts, have breath attack. That would be much stronger if we weren't wearing water flying cloth, but Moonbrook did succumb, unfortunately, so we will not have her for the duration of the walk here. Scorching Flames, not what we want to see. We do get away. Okay, maxed out the health again. Only a couple more turns here. Once we go up here and to the right, we will have completed the maze. We can just go forward and exit the road to Roan and be kind of at the top of the plateau where Hargon's castle lie in wait. That's a lot of run, Phelan. Kanok is down. We do not have a Leaf of the World tree. Down to 10 HP. Maidenhall, he does have a shield of strength he could hold up in battle to try to heal, but again, that would rely on him getting initiative. We need to find the shrine. Roan is randomized. There's Hargon's castle, but we need the shrine. The shrine gives us a full heal, and it gives us a save point. Ugh. Triple run fail. Back to Hamlin. That is a pretty decent sized setback. If we didn't get hurt by the de or, uh, hit by the defeat spell and a bunch of breath attacks there at the very end of the road to Rome, we were cruising pretty nicely through. But when enemies have randomized abilities, that can happen. So back through Roan we go, hopefully a little bit better luck this time. Again, effectively the same level, same stats, same equipment. If we can get a little bit of experience along the way, that may be helpful. About 500 experience right there, and that's not a difficult battle. Just healing afterwards takes a little bit because we only have the heal spell. Orc King also fairly benign. But 
gonna get notice I mean there's not a tremendous upswing in the amount of XP that enemies are worth keep in mind that things in the very beginning I'm sure slimes and big slugs are worth one two three experience but you know we're needing thousands to tens of thousands of experience for levels at this point and even end game enemies are only giving in the hundreds to around 200 per so really getting into Roan or finding metal slimes or metal babbles somewhere are really the best options for grinds that we can find. Back on the pitfall floor, it's not going to look like much of anything, but there are dozens of pitfalls. If you step on the wrong tile, you'll fall to a lower floor. We're just managing to avoid those by memorizing the layout. Plus, we only need to take about 12 steps on this floor as well. Down left, down right, up. to the maze, right, left. I'm trying to fight through the, the green dragons this time. They're worth a lot of experience points. They're not that difficult to kill, and we were just having such a tough time running from them that it seems like the better approach here. Right. Right again here. Only one pitfall in this entire maze, and it is in the crux of that elbow in the middle of the screen there. Avoid that pretty easily. This fork there we went up, now left, then up again, and to the right. game, this is definitely a massive upswing in the difficulty, and we can see even here in Randomizer, it is a big uptick compared to what we were doing previously and the enemies that we saw in the overworld. Even with randomized abilities, these are just that much stronger and more challenging to deal with. have defeat. That's scary, aside from the fact that they breathe fire and are generally fairly strong anyway. That's 1700 XP that Moonbrook's gonna miss out on. Hopefully, we can still make it through the rest of the cave here and find the shrine. last time because Hargon's castle were over there. We can go south, we can go east. There's the shrine. Just let us get to it, please. We can resurrect Moonbrook, save, establish a return point. to grind. The feat works very well on the Cyclops. Not the best in terms of amount they're worth, but still pretty good. Next thing I should do, and will be doing here momentarily, is taking advantage of the illusion glitch. So, 
we'll kind of let this play out, you'll see what happens, and then I'll explain exactly what on earth I just did and why. Okay, I just downgraded from the Thunder Sword to the Falcon Sword. And now I'm re-equipping the Thunder Sword. And leaving. Huh? What was the point of that? Well, let's get into an encounter, and we will see exactly what the outcome is, and we'll explain exactly what did happen. Okay. Aha! The Prince of Maidenhall attacked the Cyclops twice. So what happened there, or the so-called illusion glitch? So when we enter Hargon's castle there, it's an illusion. It looks like Maidenhall Castle, where we started the game. And that's an illusion that Hargon has created. So we are part of that right now. Anything that we do while we are in the illusion doesn't sustain. If we were to walk in and stay at the inn, and restore our health and MP. If we were to walk out, or to use the Charm of Rubus to ward the illusion away, those would reset. If we were to cast spells, swap items, change equipment, etc., all of that is wiped away. However, just because of the way the game calls out data, the game does not update stat changes until you either A, gain a level, or B, check the status screen. So by equipping the Falcon Sword before going into the castle, I have a weapon that does two attacks per turn. When I go in and equip the Thunder Sword, I have something that's much, much stronger, but only attacks once. When I walk back out, the game correctly resets my equipment to the Falcon Sword, but forgets to or doesn't yet update my attack power to account for the change. So it thinks that I have equipped a Falcon Sword with Thunder Sword Strength. And every time I level up, I will have to reset that. Or if I were to check the status screen, that would reset it as well. So one of the strategies is to basically force that and then use that glitch to grind up a little bit. Also, we can dispel the illusion and proceed through Hargon's castle with the glitch intact as well. Use that potentially to fight some of the mini-bosses along the way. If we happen to not level up in the course of that, then we can go ahead and fight Hargon, and subsequently Malroth. If we do level up, we can take the opportunity to exit and re-enter because the mini-bosses once defeated do not respawn. We've dispelled the illusion. There is a repeatable fight here at the outset. It's two gold bat boons. Not bad. 1100 XP, but it will take a little bit of time to reset each time. We would have to return back to the... Uh, to the shrine. And then walk back in, dispel the illusion, walk back up, fight the one battle, and reset it over and over again. It is a, a way to grind. Depending on what the encounter is, it can be very lucrative. Um, I've done it before where that particular encounter happened to be eight metal babbles. So, as long as you killed one each time, you gained at least five to six thousand XP. So that was pretty nice and very fast. In this case, a little less worth it, but not bad. In the meantime, we'll use our keys. We go across a bunch of nasty trap tile. Hold up the Eye of Malroth and emerge into Hargon's castle proper. So this is the final trek. And a bit of a, a gauntlet, if you will, on the way to face Hargon. So there are three mini-bosses here on set tiles, which we're going to be coming up to here shortly. Atlas, Bazuzu, and Zarlox.
Notice, the hero is now attacking for one damage each time. Mindenhall has leveled up since we activated the glitch, so now he is using effectively the very weak attack power of the Falcon Sword. Ideally, what I should do right now is to re-equip the Thunder Sword, so at least he has good attack power, but only one swing. But I do forget to do that, unfortunately, until a little bit later. So for these mini-boss encounters, it's worth noting that you cannot run from the battles. However, since they are randomized, occasionally they will spawn with a couple of other normal enemies alongside them. As long as there is a normal enemy in the rightmost position, you can run from this battle and skip it. None has spawned here, so we will have to defeat Atlas to proceed. Well, that didn't go super well. Explode it missed. Mindenhall's not doing any damage. Uh, okay. <laughs> Atlas decided, you know, you got this. Just go ahead. If you run from battles yourself, when you go back through, that trap tile will still be active, and you will have to fight the boss again, or run from it again. Because Atlas ended the battle of his own accord, we don't. Here's Bazuzu, mini-boss number two. Not getting a whole lot of damage output from Kanok or Moonbrook. We could cast Defense here. Might bring down Bazuzu's defenses a little bit, make us do a little bit more damage with Kanok. Might Hall being a bit of a meat shield up at the front. Alright, we did decrease Bazuzu's defense power by 23. Let's see if we do a little bit more damage this time around. So we'll get some heals in as well. Moonbrook did about double damage compared to the previous couple of rounds, so that's good. Kanok did about 20 versus about 10 to 12, which he was doing previously. Okay, we got through Bazuzu. Everybody is still alive. Stuck through that time. Fortunately, Moonbrook has since learned heal all, not in battle, only outside of battle, so she could not have healed herself there. She also does not have a shield of strength. Just couldn't afford one a bit earlier. She also wasn't in our party when we picked up the shields of strength. A little bit of wonky wonking here to get in the rightmost trap tile. Again, Zarlok spawns by himself, so no opportunity to run from this battle, but we will have to fight through it. Zarlok's is definitely the most challenging of the three. Bit of a mismenu there, did not mean to run, meant to parry. Very unlikely that defense or that defeat will work, but it looks like we're about to die anyway, so we gave it a shot. Unfortunately, we didn't even get the opportunity. So we'll be taking a death here. Again, had I equipped the Thunder Sword, I would at least have a chance here. Mindhold did give us a, a lucky crit there at the end, but not nearly enough to kill Zarlog, so we'll have to go back. Mindhold only needs about 400 XP to level, so it's probably advisable to get a quick level first. Then go back in. We want to try to keep the glitch active as long as possible. We won't take any fights once we're in the castle. But if we can beat the, uh, Zarlox, and we're roughly intact, we could make the play to take on Hargon and Malroth as well. Four 
four more power for the Prince of Maidenhall. That's very good. Moonbrook learned a spell. Hopefully that is going to be like heal all in battle or something. Stop spell would be nice as well. set up for dive number two into Hargon's castle. We'll set up the glitch again. And if we don't take any battles, defeating Zarlax should not give Maidenhall a level. Level-wise, right about what we said, we wanted to be at least level 20 with the Prince of Maidenhall, roughly level 15 plus with the Princess of Moonbrook, which is exactly where we are, 21 and 15 respectively. down. If we can at least get away. We did see that Kenok did learn Revive, so that is helpful. He's gonna burn up a bunch of our MP, though. Checked our spells a little bit earlier. Moonbrook did indeed learn defense. Kanok did learn increase, but neither have stop spell, so that is problematic. We're gonna make a play for it and see exactly what it's like. If Maidenhall can do enough damage, we can rush down uh, both Hargon and Malroth without having stop spell, but uh, it may be a challenge. We will just have to see. That's where we would have had the Atlas fight, but since he ran away, he's gone. But Zuzu will also be gone here. It is only Zarlox that we have to contend with. Since we know we can't run, no sense pitter pattering around the outside trying to avoid the battle tile. Well, that wasn't exactly according to plan. Can cannot get it done. He cannot. Cannock cannot. Bit unlucky there, taking a lot of damage on Maidenhall without the opportunity to heal in between. We can be a little bit more cautious this time. We'll set up the glitch once more. Actually, we do have the Sword of Destruction, I believe, on Moonbrook. So that would be something to consider as well, which I think I'm just realizing. So if we just walk back out, we'll transfer that over, because if we do it in the illusion, then it won't apply. It's just slightly better than the Thunder Sword is. was cursed. Fortunately, that curse will also not survive resolution of the illusion here. Once more, casting step guard four times, opening a couple of doors, holding high the Eye of Malroth. 
Every time you step off of barrier tiles, you have to reactivate the step card spell, unfortunately, in Dragon Warrior 2. It's not like that later on in the series, but it is the case here. Fortunately, step card is a very cheap spell to cast. It's more annoyance than anything else. So really what is going to come down to you here is a lot of DPS from Hall and a lot of parrying and healing from Kennock and Moonbrook. Kennock's job is primarily going to be to stay alive and be a, a good, wholesome meat shield for us. Moonbrook is going to similarly act and also cast Heal All to try to keep Hall alive as well. And that really will apply for both Zarlocks and the Hargon and Malroth fights. Moonbrook will also be useful to try to get out a defense if it will land. That would be also helpful to help Mightenhall get more damage in more quickly. There we go. As long as, as long as Maidenhall didn't get focus fired there, we were in good shape. Alright, final boss room. Let's see how we do. Such audacity is unforgivable. There's the exploded. Defense did not land. And Hargon's casting heal all. So we are just going to town as much as we can, try to get as much DPS in, even from Kanok and Moonbrook. See if we can overcome it. Moonbrook's doing very little. Single digits. Kanok's doing a little bit. We got through. Yeah, we needed about two rounds of him not casting heal all. In order to get through, we do. We will top everybody off here. And head into the final battle against Malroth. Again, yeah, we're going to see a lot of the same. Maidenhall DPSing, everybody else tanking hits. Moonbrook occasionally trying to heal Maidenhall along the way. Again, kind of in a tough spot here. If Moonbrook does not act early in the round, she will go down, and that will probably end our opportunities this time around. HP's all in the 50s. We're going to need to pretty much have everybody heal here. All right, we've kept Maidenhall up. Malroth cast heal all. Defense did land that time, so that is good. That means that Mindhall's going to get in a little bit more DPS in the coming rounds. We're going to need it. And with the Shield of Strength for Kennock, heal all. Moonbrook on herself. Again, in another difficult situation. Alright. Another heal all. is low. Again, another dangerous spot. Moonbrook is also getting a little bit low on MP, I think down to 38. Ooh. Moonbrook tanked a big, big hit. 
during a turn in which he was healing Maidenhall and that goes down. We are in a tough spot. Canock's down. Oh. We get him. Malroth goes down. Evil has been destroyed. Hargon's plans are ruined. And we have established peace onto the land. Now we need to find our way back home. Easier said than done. We need to try to figure out exactly where to go. Lots of different pieces of map need to be put back together. We're back here in Baran. At least we know where this is compared to everything else. Probably also could have gone through the Baran Shrine up to the so-called Jerk Cave. We actually haven't been to this area of the map because we never did go outside uh, Baran earlier. We never actually made it to Baran. But as soon as we can find one location, we'll be able to navigate ourselves home. This looks very familiar. This looks like the area that was south of Hamelin. And there is the town of Hamelin. So just the northeast here will take us back home. And that is Dragon Warrior 2. So hopefully the run was enjoyable. The time here... Uh, fairly decent. Again, it always depends a little bit on how the end game RNG treats you, what the degree of grinding needs to take place. We also got to skip out on a couple of mm, rather substantial dungeons. Uh, Charlock can be a little bit challenging, but the Sea Cave especially can take quite a while. I think we put in an estimate of two and a half hours for Dragon Warrior 2 segment of the relay race with a rough time of between 10 and 11 hours for the full 1 through 4 race playthrough. So I think this is a pretty good and conservative time for a segment such as this. Hip hip hooray. Dot done. 1 hour, 51 minutes, 16 seconds. Peace returns to the land. So again, I'm Diabetes the Second, and this recording is Dragon Warrior 2 Randomizer, submitting for Questing for Glory under the NES Dragon Warrior Randomizer's Relay Race category, the continuous three-team relay race of randomized seeds of Dragon Warriors 1, 2, 3, and 4, each seed played by a different runner per team, two-minute change over time between teammates upon seed completion. Independent commentary and tracking will accompany the race, so while I tried to provide as much commentary and information during the run as I could, this would be commentated most likely independently and tracked uh, with all key items and particular findings uh, being done by third parties uh, throughout the duration of the runs. So I will let the credits play out. Thank you so much for your consideration, and to anybody else watching, hopefully you enjoyed this run of Dragon Warrior 2 Randomizer, and we will catch you next time. Thank you.